Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisors of the Year. All right, folks, you're on The Property Couch, where each week Ben and I bring you the insider's guide to property, finance, and money management. Welcome back to The Couch, mate. Mate, jam-packed. Right, we've got Two a lot. words, jam-packed show. we got a lot on today. <laughs> we have a Very lot special on. guest. In fact, a uh, repeat very special guest, yes, Ben. So yeah. we'll get to that very, very shortly. Um, so the folks will uh, enjoy the content we've we got We have to get today. into it because I oh, know your football team won on the weekend, didn't it? Yeah, it just, did? Yeah. yeah, your paint. Thank you, whatever minutes. And then oh, we'll you want to go there mine. as soon as yours got towed up again? Towed up? We're playing with two injured oh, men. Yeah, right. Oh so, uh, yes, Fremantle did win at the House of Pain over in the West. Hey, a um, couple of things, Ben. Uh, we did a TPC Live yesterday. Yes. Um, so if you want to go to our Facebook page and get that. So um, have a little look at that. That's uh, 15 minutes on the couch with us, Ben. So that was a good one. Live, Facebook Live. Uh, a couple of other things. Um uh, we are doing the Property Couch Live, Ben, on the 7th of June, and I came in here to sort of announce last tickets, and <laughs> Stiggy's told us there's no tickets left. So sold out, mate. But I think they should just go and put themselves on a waiting list because we're just tweaking yeah. around the edges on that. So yeah. if you're interested in the 7th of June coming to TPC Live, go to thepropertycouch.com.au, download the money smart so you can make sure that we uh, we only send it out to our list first, Ben. Yep. Sold out in four hours, so but we, we just get on that waiting list because we think there might be an opportunity. So do that. A couple of things, we're in the thick of, um, uh, <laughs> there's yeah, that look on your face, and well, Ivers, um, yeah, and yeah. Ivers panics, but no, <laughs> mate, we'll find some room. Um, we're in the thick of uh, writing our book, mate, so a we couple are. of things. Um, in that book, uh, we want to know the challenges that people are having if they're implementing the money smart system, Ben, yes. and what are some of those little one, two percenters um, that they're experiencing? So in fact, the property couch sent yep. us that. Challenges and success stories. Yep, absolutely. We've done the shout out on success stories. That remains. Yep. People let us know. The sh- Beautiful. If you want to be a part of the book, bring it on. Um, but the challenges that you're having with the money smarts, we want to know what they are because we're going to include those to make sure we cover everything yeah. there. The what if scenarios when life gets in the way. And the last thing on the book is um, we're trying to accumulate as many money hacks and savings hacks as we can to put that into our yep. content. So um, Beautiful. bring that, that to us as well. Info at the Property Couch will include you. Uh, if you want to be a part of the book, let us know. We'd love to uh, include you on that. And the last thing, Ben, I'm running out of breath here. Obviously, we had uh, John Lindemann on last week. Uh, yes. You did the talk with him last night. Yes, I'm sure that went very, very well. Yep. Yes, that's right. Down at Albert Park there. And you got to meet a few of the uh, couch listeners. Yes, thank is... you very much for coming along. Loved, always love to chat and learn about people's challenges and and what they're doing in their success stories. So it was great. All right. And the last thing, Ben, last week you mentioned um, uh, the budget. Yes. A little bit pedestrian for property. Well, business. just a couple of, a couple of things on the budget. There wasn't a lot in there for housing affordability or those types of things. A couple of things that did come out about um, non-deductions. So now, vacant land. If you're holding vacant land from 1 July 2019, you won't be able to claim any deductions against that. So it's encouraging people to get more supply mm-hmm. coming into the marketplace. So if you're holding on to vacant land and you want to claim interest against that vacant land on the promise that you're going to construct something on there, which is the current law, no more. Mm-hmm. So you basically need to get those planning approvals through uh, so you can build. So I always say, okay, I don't mind the initiative government, brings more supply on, helps with housing affordability. Not a big revenue raiser. We're talking about 50 million is what they're quoting um, in, the fo- in the forwards, as they say. Um, but the other important point around that is, okay, government, if you set that challenge, we set the challenge back to you, and that is get planning approvals approved quicker. Mm. Okay, so improve that process because I would be very frustrated if I own some vacant land and I want to bring some stock onto the market, and all of a sudden it takes 12 months to get my approvals through. So obviously a challenge out there to all the town planners and all that to move quick. Was that uh, part of stage one, stage two, or stage three in 2027, that sort of initiative? Was it, no, was it nothing to do with the tax reform. We'll go there another day because there's a <laughs> well, fair, few they opinions I have around. Projecting out four elections from now. Lifters and leaners, we'll move there in another day. All right. One other thing, one other thing, which was interesting. Now, we have a, a pension scheme where you can actually access the value of your um, some some value. So it's a reverse mortgage scheme against your principal place of residence, right? Now, it's been around for a long period of time, but not too many people realised it was available because there was a lot of terms and conditions around that. So what they've done is they've uh, loosened those terms and conditions so anyone over retirement age can now access 
equity in their family home as a reverse mortgage and supplement their income on a fortnightly basis. So the government's getting back into lending, Bryce, against their family home. Well, it's a shot across the bow for the message that we're trying to tell our listeners, that even the government realises it's not, not going to be enough for our ageing population. So if that's not yeah, a... Cost of living going up. So this is a good initiative for me because it's cost of living going. And people don't necessarily want to move out of their family homes. They feel safer there and comfortable. So this is, I think, a good initiative. But that's enough for the budget. There really wasn't much else in there other than tax reform, but we'll go there another day. Mm, very good. So uh, good there, Roundup. So today my Mindset Minute is, is a segue into the introduction to our guests. Are you ready for this? Yes. Perfectionism ready. is the mother of procrastination. Version one is better than version none, Ben. Mm. So people can apply that in so many ways, right? But uh, we give ourselves reasons not to start. The reason I wanted to have that as a Mindset Minute theme is because it's dual purpose, Ben, yep. for the listeners to ponder that. But also, um, our very special guest is Stuart Weems. Oh. Welcome back to the couch, Stuart. One Thank of our favourites. Now, Stuart, you have been on before, episode 81. So if those people want to hear the back story, I recommend that uh, you listen to that if you haven't. Mate, you've just gone through the insanity of writing a book <laughs> <laughs> amongst being uh, busy uh, running your business. So, mate, perfectionism is the mother of procrastination. Version one is better than version none. How, how did that go through in your mind as you were trying to get this, uh, this book out of your mind? and uh, into the public space. Yeah, well, I um, after my second book, uh, which I wrote in 2008, I think, I told my family members, if I ever talk about writing another book, smack me around, yeah. I'm just not going to do I it. I remember having lunch with you and you're yeah. around Christmas time a couple of years back, and you're saying, I'm thinking about doing it. He flagged book. that back in episode 81. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I thought, yeah, I'm going to write another book, but this time I'll make it really hard on myself. Um, I'm not going to stop until I'm really happy with it. I said, uh, probably, I started writing it probably about two years ago, to be honest, yeah. and um, really d- wrote every single word. You know, sometimes you can work with yep. journos and yep. so forth to help you put a book together, but I didn't decide to do that. I just wanted to You're such a uh, great writer. be at my all, all my own work and, and produce something that will stand the test of time and hopefully stands the test mm. of time. So, you know, I made it really hard on myself and it's... It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> well, the, for, for those people who, uh, who want to know what the book's called, Investopoly, it's the eight golden rules for mastering the game of building wealth. And uh, Ben, there's the best way to devour uh, that book is to go to the bookstore mm-hmm. and actually get a copy because it's a really good read. But the second best, by a long way, but the second best is right here on the property couch because we're going to dive <laughs> a little headline. We're going to cover gonna a few of the headlines. Samples on the headlines. Absolutely. You understand you absolutely need we're this gonna book. We're going to whet the appetite for people to actually go and check out this book. Before we go there, um, Stu, Stu's, um, for those people who've been who haven't who quite knew, listened who to are new. Long, yep. Stuart's got over 20 years of financial services experience and founded Pro Solution in 2002. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce and is a chartered accountant and holds many postgraduate qualifications. Mate, you are a bright man. Stuart is licensed to provide credit, tax insurance, and financial advice. And his episode 81 was, does investing for the long term actually matter? And Ben, we actually covered well, that. Yeah, <laughs> there is, there's more of that in here, yeah. a lot more. A yeah, bit of a deeper dive into that in Investopoly. Before we dive, why would you invest in property now, Stuart? I mean, if you if you read the headlines, particularly in the Sydney newspapers, there's there's just no wisdom, there's no future in property. It's on this. Why would you do it? Well, if that's the noise around in the media, it's even more reason to do it. I, I would have I would have thought because it's a bit contrarian, I guess. Um, why? Well, my my answer to that was why wouldn't you do it? You know, growing population, all the fundamentals are actually there. Um, and land supply is fixed. So the, the laws of supply and demand are definitely going to work in your favour. So I, I, would, I would turn the question around, um, Bryce, and say, you know, mount a case to me why you wouldn't. Um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, it all comes into asset selection, obviously. Yep. So if you get yep. the right property, I'm not just talking about property generically, but if you buy an investment grade property, which I talk about in the book, um, I can't understand uh, anyone that could mount a case to say, over the long term, so if we're thinking out sort of 20 years or even 30 years, how you couldn't buy a property today and do extremely well, just as you would have done 30 years ago. So Stuart, how do you, you know, obviously very successful business, you've got taxation, you've got financial planning, you've got mortgage broking inside your business. When a customer comes to you or a client comes to you, how do you um, make the decision around whether it's going to be bricks and mortar versus, so because you, you're also big on index funds, 
and investing for the longer term. What are some of the, the you know, the, the nuances or ways in which you approach that with your client? And, and so the listeners can get an understanding of what their thought process needs to be in terms of where they want to diversify. And in some cases, our diversification is we buy in different states. Yeah. Uh, but how do you approach that? Yeah, excellent question, because it's really the reason why I wrote the book. I met a lot of people that come into the office and say, Stuart, I know we need to do something, but I just don't know where to start. Yeah. You know, should I be contributing to super? Should I buy, borrow and buy an investment property? Should I just concentrate on repaying the home loan a little bit more? I'm just not really sure where to start. And after speaking to them for, you know, an hour or so, getting learning a little bit about their current circumstances, any changes that might occur and their goals, it becomes very clear to me, very, very clear, probably nine times out of 10, what their next step should be. And look, there's some circumstances where they could go in different directions and it requires more work, but nine times out of 10, and that's not because I'm smart, Mm. it's because I just follow the same framework. And that's why I wrote the book, because you can put some fundamentals around it, so all the eight rules in the book aren't my opinion. They can be proven with just simple math, simple logic, often rooted in academia studies and so forth. So they can be actually proven. And I think that's the big thing about financial advice, right? People are thinking they're going off to someone that they need to trust their opinion. Well, it's not really, I mean, I guess it's an opinion in a way, but the opinion should be able, you should be able to prove that opinion. Mm. Now, if I say investing in property is that your next best step. Why, Stuart? Well, because most of the return is provided in capital growth and you need to build your asset base before you start um, investing for income. So it's this- a wonderful point. It's a wonderful point you make because I would much prefer to see a professional advisor who advises for my circumstances as opposed to just um, in the property space. We see it all the time. Someone who um, has had a bit of success in with one strategy and then they basically, they want everyone to follow their strategy. So rather than taking the personal circumstances of that individual in place and having a tailored solution for them, we see it in an unregulated marketplace where you don't need any qualifications to come into the property market and say, no, 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 don't do any of that. No, follow my protocols because this is what this is how I've done it. And they don't know anything in terms of it's not rooted in academia. Um, they don't understand it, you know, I, I, there's some great examples of mining booms and busts and you know there's companies that, that come and go ruin people's lives in that process because you know they think the mining boom is going to last forever no though this time it's different you know this time it's going to last there's snapshots of time isn't it that they Correct. say oh, I, I was able to accumulate 100 properties in this snapshot of time yeah. which doesn't necessarily relate to the current snapshot of time does it and the world is changing i mean you know the the days of being able to own 10 12 15 properties with the changes through APRA and the borrowing power changes, the world is definitely going to change. So you're going to have to, um, unless you, you know, in most cases when I see these people who have bought 15 or 20 properties in, you know, two or three years, I say two things. One, BS in terms of they've either lied, they've fraudulently acted on their applications, haven't told the true debt that they're, so I'd be like very careful, do not do that, do not engage. Do not be encouraged by people to not put your fi- your full financial circumstances on your on your lending applications. Or two, they're on mega bucks, you know. So if they're on a million dollars a year or two million, then of course that they can do that. But the average person, under the way in which credit policy is working today, they're going to hit a ceiling, aren't they? Yeah, and it's the difference between selling a product and selling advice, yeah. right? So the people that that are pushing a barrow that have a particular strategy. They're typically, not always, but typically selling a product. Yeah. And that's the, that's the big thing I think that's coming out of the Royal Commission yeah, or the government needs to talk about yeah. is they need to give an easy way, maybe regulating the word financial advisor, that you can only use that if you're independent, for yep. example. Yep. So that people realise that if they're dealing with a salesperson, that not every single time a salesperson is going to put their client before themselves and their employer. If we're dealing with a salesperson, we understand their job is to sell. The right? fiduciary duty. Yeah. Basically to put the client's best interests first. That's exactly right. So you remove the conflicts of interest, yep. then then you can get um, honest advice. Yeah, yeah. That's you uh, you hinted at it before, and um, the thing the thing that we like about you is our our philosophies are well and truly in alignment, right? So you talk about in Golden Rule Seven um, that only invest in investment grade property. Um, we, we tend to agree with them, but for the benefit of the listeners, you've got you've got three specific things that yep. you look for in investment grade property. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the good thing about um, using a rules based evidence based approach. You know, where you can it's repeatable, right? Mm. So we can, and and the good thing is that you can take these rules and you can apply it to past 
acquisitions, so people have owned investment properties and they haven't worked out. Mm. And you can apply these rules and work out, okay, well, was kind of where did I go wrong? Because I think that very few financial mistakes are as a result of random bad luck. Most financial mistakes are predictable from the outset. You know, So uh, us three can sit in front of a client and the client says, I'm gonna do this, and we can work out whether they're probably gonna be successful or not. Yep. Um, and time will either prove us wrong or right. <laughs> um, so, so really there's three things that I believe an investment property must possess to be considered investment grade. The first thing is that its overall, its land value component needs to be more than 50%, right? Because obviously land appreciates, building depreciate. So we need the, the proportion of the overall property's value to be mostly land because that's the bit that's gonna um, appreciate. The second thing is that we need some level of scarcity. Scarcity in terms of land supply. So if I'm gonna invest in a property, I really don't want there to be any land supply in the surrounding area. And that could be you know, sort of 15K or 20K radius, for example. And we want scarcity in terms of architectural style as well. So again, or, or, or making the point, you know, if we go and invest in a high rise complex with um, 300 other apartments, there's a complete lack of scarcity in that regard. And the last thing is we want proven performance because we're investing, we're not speculating. So if I'm gonna invest in a property and it does have those sound fundamentals of scarcity and strong land value component, that should be proven in the results. So therefore I can go back and track the sales over the last, let's say 30 years and imply a, a compounding capital growth rate. Now that doesn't guarantee, mm. obviously, that a it's gonna- performance. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. gonna repeat itself, except for the fact it's really strong evidence as opposed to the share market, which doesn't necessarily uh, hold true with stocks. Yes. But the thing with um, the thing with property is that the, the things that drive value tend to be factual and static. So they're factual in terms of, okay, we've got 300 square meters of uh, north-south facing land in a really good location. That's factual, that's not my opinion. You can mm. prove that, you can see it. Yep. And, it and it's static, it's not really gonna change. Same thing with amenities, hospital, schools. These things, um, they can change, but often take many decades. Mm -hmm. So the, the good chance is that if the property's accumulated or appreciated by 12% 12, 12 mm. on average over the last 30 years, I don't know what the next 30 years will look like, but it's probably gonna be pretty strong. Yeah, it's I think, definitely gonna be up there, that's for sure. And I think the key thing you said is land value, not land content, because you're still, and I know from chatting with you previously that you're a fan of the old school flats as, a, as an investment, so you know the old 1970s, 1960s. Um, as, as opposed to high rise off the plan stuff, because that fails all three of those rules that you just talked about. Absolutely, but yeah. um, I think that's important that you talk about the land value, because if you've got, um, let's just have a theoretical example of a $500,000 budget, you could maybe buy a $500,000 two bedroom 70s style flat that has high land value, or we can go out into the into the green fields and buy a house that has more land content. But yep. as, a, as a percentage of that 500,000, you're buying an old school 70s flat, a small percentage of it goes to the building, it's old, it's depreciated a large bit for the land value. Whereas if we go out in the in the burbs, a large percentage of our 500,000 is actually going to the shiny taps and the new carpets and um, leased them out to the, to the land. So it's an important distinction that people actually grasp that, that it's, it, it's, it's about land value, not land content. But once you've got the high land value area, then you're trying to get as much land content as you can comfortably afford, rather than getting the other way around. And you need to have all three. So that the, the outlying uh, property will lack the scarcity element. Mm. You know, if we go and buy in a new build area, for example, where there's a subdivision going on, you know, the land supply is abundant. And what typically happens, in my uh, opinion, in those situations, is they do you do get an uptick of land value in the first few years of a new subdivision, as that as more amenities sort of come into the area. Most most areas are going to need probably a supermarket, a dentist, and a doctor, and so forth. Yep. Um, and so you do get a little bit of an uptick, but then it tends to tends to level out. So so sometimes people get fooled into thinking, oh well, this is actually a good area because three years ago this property sold for X, and now it's selling for Y. But unfortunately, what you want is that perpetual capital growth. Well, Ben did a video called Fool's Gold uh, probably a couple of years ago. Now, mm, ben, would have been where, a while ago now. Where, where we talked, well, he talked about the fact that you know these. These new greenfields were paddocks before subdivision. So as a percentage of capital growth for the area in the immediate um, sort of years preceding the release of the land, it looks phenomenal. Tens and 15s and 20% capital growth, which a lot of these uh, product pushers uh, use as a pitch to get people interested in it. Yeah. But clearly, when you have a look under the bonnet and you see why that is, yep. you see it's fool's gold, and hence the name. And if, I th if we think about you know, what Stu was just talking about there around the amenity in the local area, if a, um, 
developer is going to d- develop a thousand lots or something like that, they absolutely know they're going to need a town centre. They absolutely know they're going to need a doctor and a dentist and, Some and a Coles or a Woolies or whatever it's going to be there. So that's not a point of difference for the longer term. So when people get out there, they might say, well, it's all new and fancy and a bit of bling to it. But the reality is, is every, every uh, uh, cluster um, or local government area has that amenity in it. So there's no real scarcity point of difference um, around that. So, you know, when you see a, an economic downturn, those people are usually carrying the highest level across the board of, of debt in those particular markets. So they're susceptible to flattening or even bigger corrections. And we've seen that through the 2001-2003 correction. And we're seeing a little bit of it now. Interestingly enough, the two areas we've seen it, we've said this all the time before, it's always in those uh, greenfield areas that are being developed because everyone stretches themselves too far. But at the moment, employment's pretty good. We're still creating more jobs. So we haven't seen an economic downturn. We've just seen a property easing. But where we have seen it is in that higher end, that real top 10% of properties where we are seeing more of the correction than what we're seeing in the sort of more broad structs, uh, medium prices in all those better areas. So good stuff, which is a great segue. Sorry, did you want to add something? I was going to say the best way to reduce your investment risk is go for quality, right? So quality will determine your assets. You can't invest in average quality asset and get above average quality returns. And the analogy I use is not just buying the diamond, but if you buy the pink diamond. Now, no matter what's going on in the economy, you're going to be able to sell a pink diamond, mm-hmm. right? And it's always going to appreciate yeah. in value and, yeah. and so forth. So you can apply the same to investing, be it property, shares, or any sort of asset. Paintings, if you just go, coins. Yep, yep. If you just go for a really high quality asset and hold it for long term, have the patience, You'll, you'll do very well. If you're going to compromise on quality, that's where you're going to compromise on return. So what does the dialogue look like for you when you're faced with a client and you've got very strong evidence-based historical um, reasons why you have a, a view on investment-grade property and someone comes in as a new client and they don't have an investment-grade property? How do you how do you handle that discussion? Because at some point you've got to have them face the facts that they don't necessarily hold a quality asset. Yeah. I'm not that subtle, Bryce. <laughs> I, I, um, I, um, tell them as it is. Yeah. And a good advisor should. You've got to be yeah. high-fiving on the things they're doing well and eyeballing them on the things they're not doing I think well. that's exactly right. You know, you, you can't, without fear or favour, you've got to share exactly what you what you think. And I would say, you know, I would say after, I, mean, I started my business 16 years ago, I, I reckon maybe 80% of property investors or more are investing in the wrong assets, mm. are actually not generating the returns that yeah. they should. So then it stands to reason that most of new clients I meet, um, well, let me put it a different way, very rarely do I meet a new client and they've got well, all their assets yeah. are really good quality. Yeah. They've at least got one dud, if not all of them mm. dud. Now that's difficult because you, then you're beginning a relationship on a very negative <laughs> tone where you're telling them, look, they're all terrible, you've got to sell them before yeah. we can start working the together. Tough love, yeah. But it is what it is, isn't it? I mean, you, I, I can't not say it. <laughs> no, well, that's, I had... that's sell versus hold scenario, isn't it? It's like ultimately you've got yep. to make a decision as to the opportunity cost of that asset in maintaining it yep. and the recycle cost in terms of potentially putting that into a better investment. Yep. Yeah. It's yep. an interesting conversation. Last week I was filming the show, so I was on location. And uh, when we like, show them four houses and then in the middle of the day we go and have some lunch, so I'm striking up the conversation with the clients. I'll keep them anonymous for this story. <laughs> um, and they just said to me, um, you know, I heard you got a podcast. What What's your views on a couple of things, right? And um, he said, um, my financial planner told me that I was only allowed to buy off the plan properties. Whoa. And so, uh, so the, as you can imagine where that story went. And then, he, and, then he, and then he goes to me, what do you think? And, I, and the reason I asked you is because I wasn't, I wasn't in an advice scenario right there, right? So I've just looked at him and I've gone, um, let me answer that by telling you what I would buy for clients, right? And I said, so when we want to buy a property, we want to be the second and subsequent purchaser only. Never want to be the first. Yeah. Um, before we even drill down a bit further, he sees mine ticking over, and he's gone. In the end, he goes, "How's that possible in a situation like me? I'm only allowed to buy brand new." And I said, "Unfortunately, you've been told the wrong story because that is not true." You see the colour go out of his eyes, and he said, "Look, I'm going to go and listen to the podcast, which is great, but um, ultimately, it's interesting when people are talking with an agenda and a product to push. Some of the th- some of the the truths that they'll spin just to get someone to." Um, to buy it. it's fine. You showed a lot of restraint there. Bro. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> well, I've got to keep them on side. But yeah. <laughs> You're I, about to make I got two days of filming. Magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, hey, you know, subconsciously we've actually 
hit rule number one, yep. which is play the long game. You know, we are, you know, investing is the long game, speculating is the short game. If you think you can make money out of speculating, it's more guesswork than fundamentals. That you, you know, that's what we know in our business. We are, we, we talk about planning for the long term. Um, and then, so I, I thought, I reckon we've nailed rule number one, which is play the long game. You want to add some more to that? Uh, well, only just um, that I, I saw that a guy called Dennis Carey has, has released a book in the US. And it's oh, about okay. it's about um, companies, investing in companies and, yes. and building companies and so forth. But the title, um, I thought, was sensational. So the title is Go Long, Why Long-Term Thinking is Your Best Short-Term Strategy. Oh. And I think that just oh, succinctly, yeah, yeah, I love it. succinctly frames that first rule, you know, because we always try to think short term, we want quick money, we'd love to sort of turn our finances around overnight, but reality is that the market um, rewards the patient yep. and punishes the impatient. Oh, I agree. When you think about the lineup of interview, uh, the guests we've had on this podcast, Stuart, they're all, they're all people who've been through multiple cycles, they've been yeah. doing it for a long time. Yourself, Jan Summers, Peter Kalouzos. Mark uh, Lomas. Yeah, the evidence. Alan Oster. Um, Craig Alan Stevens. Cora, Craig yeah. Stevens, yep. Absolutely, so that's irrefutable. All right, and so I think, sorry, Ben, yeah, no, I know go. you're about to go on, but uh, it's it's an important message for people right now when they, you know, I opened yeah. it by saying with the headlines, but people can start to say, well, oh, th- these are the times that we've been waiting, particularly as a professional buying group, to, to buy quality assets where people are just sort of sitting on the sidelines just wondering, should I, shouldn't I? It's just a beautiful time. So, but for the uneducated or the, or the people who... Um, are a bit wary, they're sitting back going, is now the time? Because they're wondering if the market's going to um, fall out. But if you have a look at the clearance rates, uh, even in Melbourne, they're consistently dropping, Sydney's dropping. But I can tell you that my team is buying assets and they're still missing out. They're still at auctions Mm -hmm. where, so the quality assets have still got um, competition, people still interested, and they're they're not necessarily going to have the you know the ten percent growth per annum, but they're still going to be cheaper today than tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> and and so if you we always say whenever your cash flow allows you should be looking to buy the next one. But that's more than ever. If your cash flow now allows right now, yeah. um, you should be and you've got that long range perspective. Now is as good a time as any. Because there will be you know we we are seeing it in the data in terms of a cooling market around general Australian supply uh, demand I should say definitely softening. In mm. terms of the number of suburbs that we've got in our good or excellent categories is definitely closing off, which means that the market's moving back to more of an equilibrium, uh, but you can still pick the eyes out of it. And this is the best time if you lift your eyes and go for that long-term horizon. So play the long game. Rule number one. Rule number two, know how much money you need and buy when. Great. I love this one. If you don't have a destination, you don't need a map. Right, yep. so you need to you need to have a goal. You need to have a destination, and then we can develop a map. And you know, when I meet new clients, I ask them, okay, so when would you like to have the flexibility to stop working, and how much money do you need? Do you think you need to live? I, almost, almost inevitably, there's two <laughs> two questions people can't answer it's or, or amazing, answer negatively. It? That one they yep. can't answer. And yep. do you have a will? No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, is, is, typi- yeah, is yeah, typically yeah. the response. They're the two really predictable responses. So then my view would be, well, then how can you expect me to give you advice if you don't know where you're going? Yeah. Um, and so it, people, I think people in, inherently find it very difficult to set long-term goals. Oh, incredibly difficult. Which I understand. So, I actually think people find it difficult to set short-term goals. Short-term goals, yeah. yeah. And stick yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well, the old adage is we overestimate what we can achieve in the short term, but underestimate in the long term. Yeah. Well, I, I've done a video on it. Um, I think we released it, Stiggy, where um, most people set their goals in the discomfort zone, but by nature of the fact that they've set, set it in the discomfort zone, they actually don't know how to achieve it. So what we normally say is, well, the next step needs to be in the comfort zone. So if I want to um, build a passive income or what you're saying, the first step is in your comfort zone, determine what is it you're aiming for. Yeah. And then because then all you have to do is the next incremental step towards these discomfort zone goals. Yeah. Um, so make it easier for listeners. Um, I think you just need to have some starting point. You don't need, yeah. doesn't really need to be very detailed. And I think there's two goals you need. When the age that yep. you want to have the yep. flexibility to stop working. And the interesting thing is that most people will say to me, look, sir, I don't think at, at a particular point in time I'll go from full time to nothing at all, yep. but more probably more flexibility in a transition into retirement, which is yep. fair enough. Yep. Um, but uh, in the absence of a better goal, I'd say 60. 60 mm. is a good one because yeah. you can access your super. So then superannuation can come into play in terms of uh, the overall strategy. And then in terms of how much money you need, a, a good sort of quasi measure is what you're spending today. 
on general living expenses. Yeah. Sorry, that's the third one that probably people can't answer. It's <laughs> yeah. what they spend on general living expenses. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. That's why I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I've come to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the good thing is, I, the really interesting thing is that if I know a client's income, age, and and whether they have any children, the age of the children. I could, I, I reckon, I could predict what they're spending within a within a sort of ten percent range, mm. um, n- within about ninety percent accuracy. Yep. And it's funny because we're all different, and mm. we all spend money on different things. Yep. But the number tends to land in yep. the, in the same spot. Yep. So whilst we're all different, we're, we're kind of all the same as well, and that's a good quasi. I mean, there's some expenses that will disappear, you know, in time, and there's some new expenses that will appear in retirement that aren't present today. But what you're spending today is a, sort of a good number to aim for. It's interesting, um, you know, we talk about the four levers, income, expenditure, time and target, right? So how much time you give me is going to obviously impact the target that I yep. hit for you because obviously that's how we do it. In professional services, we work on models and expectations and variables and parameters, forecasting and assumptions. So that's how we're doing that sort of levers that we play with. I've just been introducing to our team here this concept that if um, the clients that we're dealing with are in, say, less than 35 years of age, I actually want to have the conversation around 65. I don't necessarily want to have the conversation around 60. And I and I tell you this, I tell you this for a reason, because um, we all know that for millennials, they've had to pay for their education. Okay, so you know, um, us uh, X's and also the baby boomers, we didn't have to do that. So there's still this concept that um, that's a bit hard for them, and and we know that. The government's going to have to have tough conversations around putting retirement out to 65 and 70 over the course of the next 20 or 30 years. So I want to set that expectation early, purely on the fact that we might get there at 60, but I don't want to I don't want to over promise and under deliver. I'd much prefer our team to say 65 is a new retirement age. But hey, there's a silver lining to this. You guys are going to live to 100, whereas the baby boomers average age is probably 72 to 75. Mm. Now, uh, uh, X-Gens, we're going to be probably 80, 85. But these, this next generation, and the generation after that is potentially going to live even longer. So if I had a choice between saying that, okay, well, I have to work another five years, but I get to have 30 years of active retirement as opposed to working to 60, but by 70, my knees are gone and I've had two hip replacements because I did it hard. Yeah. What would you take? Yeah. I'd probably take the younger age and the longer time of being able to travel the world and do those things. So by setting that expectation based on the, the age bracket that I'm talking to, the 40s, you know, depending on whether they've started their investment journey or not, some of that expectation is it's going to be 65 anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're coming from a long way back, you haven't put any money away. So it's a, yeah. it's an interesting story in terms of what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. And longevity risk, outliving our money, yeah. um, is, a, is a big one, I think, because yeah. um, Mark Cuban w- made the prediction that the, the advances in technology in the next decade will more than precede the last three, which is yes. is, is not a hard thing to get your head around. No. So, um, yeah, so, so my statistically, my um, life expectancy, I'm 43 today, is is 83 yeah. but you know over the next 40 years it's um, going to get better yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so we'll jump around so rule number two yep we're going to jump around a bit we'll jump around so still yeah, okay so, so people, people can to go and buy the book good yeah, got to buy the book to get all, um, all the gold <laughs> let's let's jump to um uh, protect your investments from unexpected risk building a moat around the portfolio which uh, we are in alignment on that as well oh, yes so i think i think most investors uh, consider return and ignore risk Whereas um, really experienced investors think about risk first, mm. and if they're comfortable with the risk, then they start thinking about return. And so I think we can learn from that, you yeah. know. Um, and there's two elements obviously to a return: risk and reward. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I think what I would encourage people to do is is develop a plan, and then sit down and think about all the things that can go wrong with that plan, and then work out if these things happen, what am I going to do? Mm. So obviously death would be one of them. So we can get some life insurance and put it in our super fund. And if we're, if we're, you know, in our forties or, or younger, it's probably not going to cost that much. Mm. Um, if uh, I can have a, a car accident and not work for the next seven years, you know, breaking a leg and being off work for a couple of months, probably not such a big deal, mm. but it's that longer term incapacity, we can get some income protection insurance. Yep. Yep. Um, and just think about all the things that can kind of go wrong, you know, get a, a bad tenant and they ruin the property or need some landlord insurance. So there's a lot of things that you can you can do to mitigate risk. 
Um, and the people get, that get stuck are the people that just don't think about risk and don't think about, or, or think about risk and think, oh, that's never going to happen. Mm. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in a car accident. As my wife will attest, I'm a tremendous driver, so I probably <laughs> will never be in an accident. But um, uh, well, that's not true. So actually. clearly you're not text messaging. No, no, no. no. Um, yeah, so, so that's what I that's what I really encourage people to do. And I, I find that people grossly underestimate risk. Now, I'm not here to invent risks, right? So if we think about them and we think, oh, no, I'm quite comfortable, then, then nine times out of ten, that's enough, right? So you don't need to necessarily invent all these risks and be so worried about them. But the thing, the mistake that people make is they just don't consider it. They don't think about it and they don't ask themselves the question. If I have happened, a real-life story in this, in this particular case, Stuart. My brother's fiancée, she was 37 years of age. She took the three boys on holidays to Phuket. She fell down a set of stairs. She banged her head, had a bleed on the brain and never woke up. Wow. So we lost her um, four or five years ago around, you know, something that you would never expect. A young, fit, healthy, happy Yvette. Um, is no longer with us and there's my brother with three boys under 10 mm. who had to be looked after. Mm. So to say that it doesn't happen um, is just, you know, it's just basically head in the sand stuff. It absolutely happens and when it happens, it's the worst thing you can ever experience. You never want to see anyone have to go through it. But to know that we actually had some defence, as we call it, in place meant that, you know, Jeremy's been able to put an extension onto the house uh, provide a you know a, a, a home that's and also has an investment property and some other investments. So we've been able to take a legacy that Yvette has left in terms of some of that money to put it to work to support him and the family um, in terms of that. So I've I've had it real life in in my situation, and so I can never be more passionate about understanding the the importance of putting those protections around you. Yeah, and I think income protections, by far, in my opinion, income protection insurance is the most important yeah. one. And and really, it's quite valuable if we think about it. We might be insuring the next, uh, say, for 40, the next 20 years of income or 25 mm-hmm. years of income might be worth, really in today's dollars, maybe $2 million asset. Now, we, we spend a few hundred bucks to insure our car, and if our car was <laughs> stolen... Financially, it'd be a, a bit of a pain in the neck, but yeah. you'd probably get over it. But yep. if we lost our income for the next 25 years, yeah. you're never going to recover from correct, that. Correct, correct. So it just doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yep. And, and as a bit of a tip, most industry super funds will have pretty, um, it used to be a, a lot cheaper, but mm. still pretty um, competitive life and, and TPD, total and permanent disability insurance. Yep. So it's a good place to get life and TPD, but you want income protection outside super. So you not, do. Not within and you want to, and, and in the plan that you're building, you model that in, yep. in terms of your cash flows. It's a cost because, of investing. Correct, it's, a, it, it's, it's an asset. Yep. Mm. It's an asset that you hope you ever, never, ever, ever, ever have to call on. Yep. But when you do, it's there for you. Yep. And it's that safety net, it's that risk mitigation that's so critical. So the other things people need to think about, obviously, as I spoke about wills, most people don't have current wills and, and look, they're, they're important, but we hope they're not urgent, but yep. they, they don't have to cost a lot of money and don't have to take a lot of time to put together. Yep. But a good estate planning lawyer can put some really good quality wills together and it's yes. actually not as painful process as we might think it might be. <laughs> um, and then the other asset protection considerations, probably statistically are relationship breakdowns, yeah. right? And I don't know if there's a lot you can necessarily do about that other than no. sort of look after your wife and, and be a good person, all those sorts yeah. of things. But um, but statistically, that, you know, that yeah. about one sort in of, three. Is yes, it still? something like that. Yep, yep. Um, so there's things that you can do, you know, we've got a prenup or, or some sort of finance, binding financial agreement that you can put in place to say, hey, if it doesn't work out, then at least we take what we brought into the relationship, yep. for example, and, sp- and split the difference or yep. something along those lines. Yep. But um, being a little proactive in that regard is, yeah. a, is a good way to do it. The other thing that, um, that I've learned is collaborative law. So there's this new sort of theme, I don't know if you guys know a lot about it, but around collaborative law that, that the court system was designed hundreds of years ago and wasn't really designed for family law um, actions. Yep. And, and, it's, and it creates more conflict than it does resolutions. And yep. so this theme around collaborative law is that everyone has representation, but we get around the table to try and nut out what is the best answer. Yeah. And you can include your financial advisor in this because quite often um, one party, one spouse will have a lot of borrowing capacity and the other person might have a lot of assets. So you can kind of um, build a plan that helps those two yep. parties okay. separate together. So yeah. uh, even having a conversation around that and say, look, if we, if we ever got to that point, we're, yeah. we're going to go down that route, yeah, for great. example. Okay, is, some great advice there. 
Hmm. Now, Ben, just for time, we're just going to go for one more here of the uh, of the eight golden rules. Um, uh, number five, Stuart. Um, Interesting. Uh, set your allocation to reduce risk and maximise returns. Good deal. So the old old adage is, you know, diversification, spread your eggs, put them in different baskets. Yep. And, and asset allocation is really the, the one thing we as investors can control. So we can't control markets yep. and we can't control returns. Now, we, we hope over the long run returns will level out and they'll be what we expect them to be. Yep. And in fact, the returns, if you look in the Australian stock market, the US stock market and the Australian property market over the last 30 years are broadly similar. It's similar. It's between nine and 12 percent. So if you get nine or 12, if you're going to invest in an asset at nine or 12 percent return, it's it's going to work for you. So yep. it's not really about shares or property or that sort of it's thing. Leverage. It's about leverage, <laughs> yeah. and then it's about asset allocation. So Ray Dalio, who's uh, he's in the top 50 richest people in the world, but he runs Bridgewater, which is the largest head fund, head in, fund. in the world. Yep. He says you've got to when you build an asset allocation, which is really how much do I invest in property and shares and bonds and cash and so forth. Uh, when you d- design an asset allocation, you have to start with the starting assumption has to be you have no idea what's going to happen next. Mm. So no one in the world has built any sort of model or tool that accurately predicts which asset class is going to perform best yep. in the in the shorter term, right? So Obviously, that's why rule number one, just think long term. You don't yep. really then need to worry about it. Yeah. But yep. the interesting thing, I haven't seen any research, but I did some research into the the volatility in the Australian property market and whether there's any the correlation to, towards other assets. And so um, in the share market, volatility is about 20%, which means that long term returns about 10%. So if you've got a 20% volatility, you can expect most of your time, your return's going to be between either negative 20% or positive 30%, right? Big range, yep. big volatility, we understand yep. that. Um, bonds makes a lot of people nervous. Makes a lot of people yep. nervous. Yep. But again, if you're investing for long term, who really cares about intermittent volatility? Yep. But it's not appropriate for all people, you're yes. right, Ben. So um, bonds are about a third of the volatility of shares, are in the range of between 5 and, and 10%. And property, residential property, that's just Melbourne and Sydney, uh, is about 10%. And volatility doesn't really change. If you measure over a 30-year period or a five-year period, it doesn't really change very yeah, much. It's, that's, that's it's, it's about the same. In terms of correlation, so the whole idea is to invest in negative correlated assets, which means that if one rises, if one drops, sorry, the other one rises. Yeah. And if you if you invest half your money in each of them, then you, you, you're going to produce a positive return each and every year. Uh, so there's no correlation between property and uh, and share and the share market, which is kind of good because we have our super in in shares and yep. and property um, outside, yep, you know, yep. family home and so forth. So it kind of works well uh, wealth building wise. But there's a negative correlation, strong negative correlation between bonds and property, which makes sense, right? Yep. Interest rates and interest rates are, are higher. Um, uh, growth is is lower typically, and when rates are lower, growth's higher. Yeah. So I guess the one thing out of that is that people can take away is to say, well, having my uh, super in the share market is actually quite a good idea from a diversification perspective. Yes. And if I'm quite heavy into property and I've got a lot of borrowings, then maybe what I should do is have quite a conservative asset allocation inside super, which means more invested in bonds, given bonds have a negative correlation with property. Yeah. But it's just a way of sort of thinking about all your assets, and in the book what i've done is back tested a whole bunch of different asset allocations so ones are for all all property or no property all shares and so forth and people can see how that would have performed over the last 30 years and what asset allocation might suit them did you put um i must admit i haven't seen that part of the book did you put gearing on the property or no no i just looked at gross 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 returns returns. irrespective of sort of gearing arrangements but that's what i sort of talk about in rule number four which is really growing your asset base first and then tilting towards income and the best way to grow your asset base is to gear so typically not for everyone but most people investing in property rather than contributing to super should probably be their first port of call wow some very good wisdom. I, I must admit, Ben um, uh, Stewart is always coming out with something. He, he doesn't sort of rinse and repeat on his thoughts. It's, no, um, it's, it's new. I've, it's, got, I've got one last one. Have you yeah, got last one? No, well, I, I just want to say, you know, um, I read Stu's blogs. I get a lot out of them. Um, I'm always learning. Um, and so, you know, also we'll put in the show notes a link to Stuart's blog because I think there's some great stuff in there. Um, to, to also look at, but uh, over to you, mate. So uh, we are on a campaign with the Property Couch to make sure that our listeners make better decisions, and part of that is finding the right guide who can help them. Um, so in in the book you talk about, um, uh, I'll just check you did about the trust, the advisor. 
Yep. yep. How, how can the listeners make sure that they are talking to someone? What are some of the principles that you can share with them to make sure that they're talking to the right person? Because we'd all love them to talk to you and us, and, but ultimately there's people all around this country talking to advisors. How, how will they know if they're dealing with a good one? Uh, well, I think if, if there's two types of advice. There's strategic advice and then asset class advice. So if I want strategic advice, which is really kind of the question that I started with, which is, Stuart, I know I need to do something, but I'm not sure where to start, yeah. then they should deal with someone that's independent. And someone independent doesn't make any money from the advice outcome. So if I say to you, Bryce, invest in property or start a self managed super fund or um, don't do anything at all, in fact, I shouldn't have any vested interest in the outcome. So there's, I don't make any more or less money irrespective of the advice that I give. And that's the thing, that's the theme really out of every negative, terrible story that's coming out of the Royal Commission is there's mm. a conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah. And you remove the conflict of interest, yeah. all you're left with is, does the advisor know what they're talking about and do I like dealing with them? Mm. Yep. And that if it's asset specific advice, asset class specific advice, like I know I need to invest in property, uh, then then you don't necessarily need to worry about independence because you've already made that decision. Then go off and find yourself a good buyer's agent and so forth. The other thing, one of my mentors um, says to me, look, Stuart, only a, a poor man can't teach another poor man how to be rich. Only a rich man can teach a poor man how to be rich. So that is that the advisor doesn't necessarily need to be mega, mega wealthy, but they need to eat their own cooking. So they need to have, uh, uh, they need to be investors themselves. Walk a mile, see a mile. Yeah, yep. exactly right. Yep. And, and that speaks, that really speaks volume. Now, naturally, that's what that means is that the financial planning market is quite segment, segmented, right? Fragmented, I should say. Mm. Um, in that, uh, there's a lot of employee advisors that work for the banks and AMP and and so forth. But then there's a lot of uh, one or two man bands that believe advice should be delivered in a different way. So I think nine times out of 10, that's probably who you're looking for. Mm. Someone that has a lot of experience, that's independent, that's been doing a long for a long period of time that sort of just charges a, a fee for their service rather yep. than takes a commission. There's that fee for service. There's another clue about independence because if you're getting paid by some other third party, the independence is also then challenged around that. Mate, that was phenomenal. So the book's called Investopoly. Um, it's got the Monopoly sort of front cover look about it. Available in all good bookstores. We'll have a link in our show notes, Ben, on how they can get that. I think uh, Stuart's going to offer some discounts for Property Couch listeners. Oh, fantastic. Uh, which is um, pretty significant. So all you need is the uh, the code COUCH. COUCH. Ben. And, and how much do you say, Bryce? 30%. 30%? <laughs> <laughs> Which is terrific. So, hey, mate, you're always generous with your time. We appreciate you you're coming on and sharing that. And uh, we obviously uh, did a uh, you know a quick dive into some of those things. But if people get their hands on that book, they can uh, obviously, in the comfort of their own time, Ben, d- dive It's a, a reference deeper. guide. Mm. It, you know, all great investment books should be read and then referenced. Mm. Like, you know, you should, you should be able to come back and, and look at this information to, to just uh, re-engage, get some confidence back in terms of the long game that you're playing. A bit like our book in terms of, you know, we wanted the, the armchair guide to be about, okay, what do I need to understand? What are some of the basics? And, and that's what our new book is going to be. You know, we, we will basically take people on a story line, but there's also, it's, we want to go back and reference, oh, what happens in this situation? Where are, the, where are the clues that are going to see you get the results? But also, you know, you still need that great mentor, great coach, great advisor who can, you know, keep you on the straight and narrow. Stuart's one of the good guys, which is why we have him on the couch, Ben. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Stuart, I have this, um, this sign-off where I, I do a life hack. And um, I've got to try and find little ways just to have a little um, uh, efficiency in what I'm doing. So, Ben. What have um, you got? As you know, I'm I'm very I'm very blessed professionally. I love what I do. I'm really lucky, right? But um, the the part about my job that I don't love is airports, right? So yeah. if Chris Helder was here, he'd say, Useful. "Love airplane <laughs> food. I love airports." <laughs> but I I've got to be honest, I don't love airports, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm finding new new creative ways to kill a bit of time when I'm sitting at a at an airport gate. So I don't know if you've got Google Earth on your phone. Have you got Google Earth yeah, on your yeah, phone? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Benjamin, I don't think no, I've you got don't. The app, Ivis, no. no. So the, the app's a really great thing, Ben, because what happens is it's got this little, um, do you know like this, the wheel on an old-fashioned boat? Yeah. Um, you know, on a, on a yeah, Captain yes. Cook's wheel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the top of the app, you click on that, and what it does is it allows you to go on some journeys, right? So 
You, you've seen that? Yeah, I've seen it. It's so really, I'm yeah, sitting yeah, there yeah, and, yeah. And, and it actually takes me and it's almost like I'm creating my own little documentary because I was looking at all the ports in the south of France the other night yeah. or I can go through and have a look through um, Poland or I can go and check out... Route 66 and, in America. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I know so, what you're talking about now. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's amazing and I'm just sitting there, I'm getting lost in time and then all of a sudden before I know it, I'm caught on the plane. So lots of our listeners are... I know they listen on the train, they listen while they're at the gym, they listen while they're running. But if you're sitting there and the podcast is over, why don't you check it out? Download Google Earth, Ben. Um, as, a, as a professional property buyer, I use Google Earth a lot. Um, but just a little little side thing that you can do to have a little play around, do a little tour. And see how amazing this planet is yeah. on the journey as well. Makes us look pretty small. So did you know? Did you know? So a little bit of a pivot on did you know, Bryce? Mm-hmm. This week's did you know is actually about... Um, I'm putting my picker hat on Mm -hmm. as the chair of the Property Investors Council of Australia and I'm letting everyone know that we have set up a petition. We've just set up a petition, a campaign. I've signed it. You've signed it. Thank you very much for signing. Um, To Mr Shorten and the Labor Party about um, our concerns around the poorly crafted negative gearing policy Mm -hmm. um, that they've put forward. We are worried about job losses, we're worried about property prices, we're worried about rents rising, we're worried about overdevelopments on some of the inner city land that could become very expensive if people are seen to be able to get reuse out of that land. So, you know, that could change the fabric of some of our inner city areas. So there's some some reasonable concerns that we have there. And I just don't know whether they've thought through that with the policy that they put forward. So we want to get as many people signing that petition as possible mm. so we can get our concerns out there and enter into dialogue in terms of how we can prove that. So this is not an attack on the Australian Labor Party. Um, this is not an attack on politics. This is effectively our concern around this dangerous policy. I want to stress that because um, we've had a little bit of feedback. I got a little email last night about someone saying that this is a liberal positioning. It's not a liberal positioning. If you want me to go after the liberal party, I'll do that as well. They shouldn't have done what they did with depreciation, and they should allow us to go and at least have Spect a, a cap properties. on spending in terms of in, inspecting our half a million dollar, a million dollar businesses that we've got running up up the hill, you know, in another state. So it's important for us to understand that we'll call out poor policy um, when you haven't engaged with investors. So there are over 2.2 million property investors out there. We want to hear whether you believe that this is poor policy as well. And we're also concerned not only for property investors, but for everyone who owns a property in Australia, how it's going to affect them. Because at the end of the day, investors only make up 30% of the overall property market, not the 70% that owner occupies. So we are concerned about mum and dad owners who are going to be caught up in this macro intervention inside an open property market. So um, please in, sign the petition. Because in theory, um, you know, the, the family home has t- typically been protected by the ballot box in terms of the fact that no government really wants to damage the value of everyone's home. Correct. But that policy, not the party, as not you Not the said, party, the policy. That policy is for the first time in a, in a, in a long time that yep. your house might not be ballot box protected by... Um, by that policy that they're taking to the election. So I agree. So how do people, we're going to get in the show Show notes. notes. There'll be a link straight through to change.org to where you sign up and share it on your socials, get behind it. If you see people who are arguing the case that it's important that we look after housing affordability, we agree too. Mm. Okay, are you arguing the case that negative gearing doesn't need to change? No, we're not arguing that case. We would welcome dialogue around talking about how we would look at negative gearing and some of the excesses that may live in that. The same sort of principles we have around capital gains tax exemptions. So it's not just negative gearing, it's capital gains tax exemptions. So if the Labor Party also implement that, we won't sell our properties. Mm. And that will mean that there's less stock on the market and that's gonna put property prices under pressure. Mm. And and also we're gonna pass on some of those costs to renters. So it's important that they understand that those consequences are there. So we don't want speculators in the property market, we want long-termers. As Stuart was talking about before, we're playing the long game here. So we supply all the important rental stock for people who are moving into state, who are looking to live closer into the city, uh, new migrants to Australia, mum and dad investors are doing that work and we think it's important that their voice is heard and their concerns are raised around how this policy could be damaging 
for the property market and the economy as a whole. Show notes uh, on our socials, Ben. Uh, get involved if you can share it amongst your networks. That'd be great. And how many how many signatures are you chasing? One hundred thousand, Bryce. Mm-hmm. So we think that by the election, we want to have a hundred thousand signatures on there. So it's a big ask. We've set ourselves a big, big challenge to get out there. But I think if people understood what's at risk here, um, you know, if the wealth effect occurs and people don't spend money, that's going to put our economy under pressure and jobs under pressure. So you know, a vibrant Australia needs vibrant jobs and a thriving open market. And this type of intervention, we think is going to limit that um, because of the importance in in terms of the flow through that occurs through economic activity through construction and residential construction and commercial construction is an important part of that. Get on board listeners, Stiggy, we'll make that really easy for people to sign that uh, just by clicking wherever they're listening to this right now, Ben, um, and get involved if they uh, really want to support that and get it behind you. So, well done. Good Thanks again, Stuart. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Appreciate cool. it. So, uh, we'll make sure that... Uh, Check his great book out, everyone. <laughs> as, as well as his other two great books, if you're interested in mortgage lending. Has your family kept you accountable? We'll make sure you're not going to write another one. I'm definitely... <laughs> I'll say it right here now. I'm definitely not going to write another one. All right, you heard it here, Until folks. I have another better idea. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. So you definitely won't write another one. Until next week, Ben. Knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Be here. See you next week.